over this summer, over this, this past summer, I was on retreat at a Benedictine monastery in, in Pennsylvania. And I usually try uh, my best not to spend too much time on my phone uh, while I'm on retreat, while I'm supposed to be praying, or I guess at the very least sleeping, right? Uh, but one day early on in this retreat, uh, I, I snuck a peek, probably sometime around noon, to see if I had any messages on my, on my cell phone. And I realized that one of the friars in, in my community had texted me. Uh, now, I'm on, on retreat, and usually the friars know, don't text me while I'm on retreat, right? So, got this message, this must be important. So I open up the text and, and I take a look. Well, what does it say? It says, today's the day, are you watching? Today's the day, are you watching? I'm thinking, today's the day, am I watching? Uh, man, this guy better be talking about the end of the world if he's going to be <laughs> texting me and bothering me on retreat. But I read the second part of his message. It says, today's the day, July 4th, time for the Nathan's famous hot dog eating championship. <laughs> this guy literally texted me while I'm on retreat. He knew I was on retreat to tell me that it was time for the July 4th hot dog eating uh, championship on Coney Island. And I could not have been more thankful that he texted me that. Uh, I had almost completely forgotten. Praise God, he reminded me. Uh, I jumped on YouTube, because uh, I had Wi-Fi. I found a live stream from high up above uh, the corner of Surf and Stillwell there in, in Brooklyn, New York. And I watched a half an hour of American greatness. Uh, there was Joey Jaws chestnut pieces of hot dog and bun just dripping down his chin. The crowd, you know, roared and urged him to surpass his record of 76 francs in 10 minutes. Not bad. Uh, and as I watched in this combination of horror and enthralled curiosity, part of me wanted to proudly declare this is what America is all about. Uh, but is it? But is it? Uh, later that evening, I gathered with a group of people on the uh, front steps of the Monastery Basilica to watch uh, the sky just light up with, with fireworks uh, above the, the small western Pennsylvania town of Latrobe and families of multiple generations, just ood and odd, 70-year-old uh, uh, grandparents just as captivated by the fireworks as the four-year-old grandchildren. And I looked around at this scene, you know, something straight out of a Norman Rockwell painting, and I thought, this is what America is all about. But is it? But is it? I mean, it's probably a little bit closer to the heart of what America is about than uh, uh, watching a man expand his stomach enough to fit an entire shopping cart of, worth of hot dogs. But it still doesn't seem to get completely at the heart of the matter, does it? I think everyone has an idea of what America is all about. I'm sure all of you here have an idea of what America is all about. Uh, baseball, McDonald's, uh, apple pie, Good old boys drinking whiskey and rye, a little bit of chicken fried, cold beer on a Friday night, a pair of jeans that fit just right. Based on our uh, upbringings, our life experiences, we're all going to have different answers to that. But I guarantee that if you polled every single person in this country and asked them to name one thing that they most associated with America, I think you would find a pretty consistent answer. Freedom. Freedom. America and freedom are pretty much synonymous. Since before this country even gained independence, it was seen as a beacon of freedom. And although we've certainly experienced our, our highs and our lows, our, our, our triumphs and our hardships as a nation, this hope and this promise of freedom has prevailed all the way until the present day. But what exactly is freedom? Uh, can we define it? Sometimes I think we've almost memed freedom to a certain degree, right? We've taken it for granted to such an extent that we've almost made a little bit of a joke of it. Freedom is uh, 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 an American flag tank top worn by a guy barbecuing ribs while drinking PBR and listening to Creedence Clearwater Revival. Or 
freedom is uh, uh, a picture of Abraham Lincoln uh, riding a bald eagle with, with lasers shooting out of its eyes or something like that. Uh, many of you probably even remember there was that movie like 20 years ago, Team America, uh, which was more or less just this lampoon of this hop, uh, hyper macho patriotism that we kind of found in the wake of September 11th. But beyond uh, turning freedom into somewhat of a punchline, we've also afforded with turning, into, turning freedom into something that is morally dangerous. Somewhere along the line, uh, declaring that we live in a free country lost all association with, with rights and responsibilities that are shared by the masses and instead became this kind of rallying cry for those who desire to do whatever they please whenever they darn well feel like doing it. And now look where we are today. Look where we are right now. Suddenly, freedom means a breakdown in marriage. Freedom means a deterioration of traditional family structure. Freedom means the upheaval of sexual norms. Freedom means uh, dismembering unborn babies in the womb out of convenience. Freedom means being able to harass people openly because of their differing views and ideologies. Freedom means the destruction of societal pillars that have kept our nation firm for 250 years. That's not freedom, but it's what we've solely turned freedom into. But the idea of American freedom has never been about doing whatever you want. It's never been about catering to your own desires without any regard at all for your fellow man. It's never been about the me, 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 but rather the we, 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 the people. That's why of anyone who has ever attempted to define this idea of, of American freedom, ironically, I don't think anyone has ever done it better than a Polish man, Karol Wojtyla, also known as Pope St. John Paul II. During his visit to the United States in 1995, the Pope issued a homily uh, during Holy Mass at a packed Camden Yards ballpark in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, there he addressed the reality of freedom through a Catholic perspective, and he, he did it in one profound sentence. He said this, freedom consists not in doing what we like, but having the right to do what we ought. Freedom consists not in doing what we like, but in having the right to do what we ought. Now remember, this homily is being given to a Catholic audience, sure, but in a country where religious affiliation is already uh, on the decline, and society is settling into this kind of new norm after the upheaval of, of social mores that were really brought about, I think, by the sexual revolution in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, with this in mind, the Pope was very much aware of all this, so he nuanced his line by reminding Americans of another reality, and it's one that I think that we had already at that time uh, begun to forget. He said, there can be no freedom without truth. There can be no freedom without truth. Without a communal sense of truth, there can be no communal understanding of what action we ought to have the right to do. If we don't know who we are and why we exist as a nation, we can have no true sense of duty. And this is why the Pope emphasized that Americans must be united in truth. Americans must be united in a belief that truth is objective and based in right reason. Americans must be united in knowledge that truth is knowable and brings us to a deeper understanding of the dignity of the human person and a greater reverence for our shared origin and destiny in the sight of a loving God. Uh, as a matter of fact, in this single homily, Pope John Paul II used the word truth 21 separate times, 21 times in one homily. Do you think he might have been trying to emphasize something? Uh, perhaps something that we as Americans had already begun the process of forgetting. Uh, you know who didn't forget this idea that truth, uh, that freedom is based upon truth? Our founding fathers. They never forgot that. It was paramount to the philosophy upon which our country was built. Uh, at the dawn of this country's existence and the, the drafting of our, our founding documents, John Adams declared uh, that, quote, our constitution is made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. 
wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Uh, he was not alone in this sentiment. It was a shared sentiment. But what did he mean by this? He understood what Pope John Paul II would stress 225 years later, and that is that there is no, uh, there's no true freedom without a shared sense of what is right. If freedom is to do, what, uh, to do what we ought, we need to have a collective understanding of what we ought to do. This has always been the foundation of American freedom. It's not a complete freedom. It's not a freedom from the moral and the natural law that, that binds us together. Rather, it's a freedom uh, to, to adhere to a moral and natural law. It's a freedom meant to draw an entire nation into a unified sense of morality and duty. We're meant to have a shared sense of value and virtue, of truth and goodness. What does that freedom look like uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, it can be exhibited in, in countless ways, right? From embracing family life to enforcing laws to treating others as equals under God, from celebrating a funeral to opening a door for someone to educating children. Because uh, at its heart, American freedom simply means the right to do what we ought, the right to do what is good, the right to do what is true, the right to do uh, that which acknowledges the reality that we are dignified creations made by a loving creator in his own image. And we're meant to share that sense of freedom with our brothers, our sisters, our family, friends, and neighbors because we believe that that freedom is life-giving. We believe that it's better to have this freedom than to not have this freedom. And this is how we as Americans have always responded to the freedom afforded to us, right? We're thankful for what we have, and we understand that out of that gratitude should arise uh, a sense of humble duty to share what is good with others, with those who need to hear that joy comes not from a, a total sense of moral liberation, but from a shared sense of truth and, and duty to that truth. Consider, uh, for example, Emma Lazarus's poem, The New Colossus. This is the poem that everyone knows as the one in, inscribed on the plaque inside of the pedestal of the uh, Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. It says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. That poem has been used, I think, a lot in recent times uh, to, live, to deliver sort of a, a political message mm -hmm. about maybe a need for diversity in our country. And diversity is, is wonderful, right? But that's not what this poem is about, not at its heart. It's a poem about, it's not a poem about a, a nebulous sense of, of diversity being our strength. Rather, it's meant to highlight the fact that in this country, our strength is to be found in our freedom and in our commonly held values that happen to be available to a, to a diverse group of people. And that ideal, uh, that, that concept of freedom is not merely available for all people and uh, classes and religions and backgrounds, but exalted, exalted for all people uh, of all classes and religious, religions and, and backgrounds. Why do you think the Statue of Liberty was meant to be the first thing that people saw when they, when they uh, approached Ellis Island? The statue was meant to be a beacon. This is what our country is all about, and we love it so much. We love what this country stands for so much, we want to just share that with everyone. It's uh, like Woody Guthrie once sang, right? This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the redwood forests to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. And it's made for you and me not because there's some kind of ethereal sense of strength that comes from diversity, but because the Mer American uh, concept of freedom and shared sense of duty to the common good is such a wonderful thing that it should be shared for all people. Think about it. This is why we have a constitution and a bill of rights. Our founders wanted to ensure that the freedom that our country was built upon was available to every citizen. Guys, not every country has this, right? 
We can't take this for granted. Not every country has an inherent belief that no matter who you are, or no matter what your background is, or no matter what religion you practice, we can be united by a shared sense uh, of freedom and a shared sense of duty to truth. That's why I, I, I look with pride upon the uh, service of United States military veterans. I'm proud, as I'm sure we all are, to live in a country where freedom is so cherished uh, that we have sought to protect ourselves and others abroad from its enemies, from evil men throughout history who have sought to destroy truth, to destroy freedom, sought to rob human beings of their rightful dignity, sought to destroy the sense of duty to each other that we should all possess. Uh, our veterans are not just protectors of our way of life as Americans, but for over 200 years have been protectors of, of truth and freedom everywhere in the world, right? These are men and women who have understood what they ought to do uh, and did it not just out of a sense of, of nationalistic pride or patriotism, but out of a sense of duty to share what is good with others. And in this sense, uh, I don't just look with reverence upon our military, although I do believe they're, they're worthy of a, of a special reverence, but also upon every man and woman who out of a sense of duty has sought to share this idea of American freedom with others. Parents, teachers, clergy, uh, leaders of all sorts, anyone who has ever instilled within another the right to act in truth and in virtue is worthy of commendation. Brothers, this is patriotism. This is patriotism. It's not just a love for one's country uh, and its freedom and its values, but a duty and a desire to share those things with others for the good of others, no matter what sacrifices that may take. And what I'm, what I'm here to tell you today uh, is that we, as American men, uh, as American patriots, should think about our Catholic faith in the same way uh, that our fathers and our grandfathers think and have thought about our country and the type of freedom that our country affords to us. Our Catholic faith is something true and good. It's something that we believe brings freedom, both, both the freedom to do what we ought and the freedom of, of knowing Christ, the freedom that comes from knowing Christ, that interior freedom. Our faith is something that we believe is meant to be life-giving. It's meant to, to bring joy to everyone who possesses it. Uh, therefore, we should desire to share that with others. We should want to share it with others for the good of others. That is our duty as American Catholic men. Because just as we're not called to be isolationists as a nation, uh, we're not called to be isolationists in our faith either. American freedom is an exceptional freedom, but the freedom that we find in Christ is even more exceptional than that. There's an incredible hope for all of us in being Americans, but there's a drastically greater hope in being part of the Catholic Church. These great lights should never be hidden under a bushel. They should be allowed to shine. And this may sound obvious to us. You know, we say, of course, of course, right? I want to share my freedom with others. Of course, I want to share my faith with others. Nothing means more to me than my freedom and my faith. I want others to experience how life-giving it is to have a relationship with the Lord and a sense of duty to uh, our fellow brothers and sisters. But somehow, these days, this mentality stands in stark contrast to the ideas and, uh, of faith and patriotism that have become so prevalent today. Uh, out of a sense of disillusionment, maybe, with the state of our country or the state of the world, uh, so many good men have begun this, this sorrowful process of retreating within themselves. Lock the doors, batten down the, the hatches. This country is closed. It's time to take care of me and mine. I've got my Bible. I've got my relationship with Jesus. I've got everything I need right here. Why should I be concerned at all with my duty to anybody else? Why should I be concerned about another person's relationship with God when I have that relationship personally? And that's all I'm worried about. Brothers, I, I fear that we've begun to equate patriotism 
with isolationism. And the way that we live our faith as Catholics threatens to follow suit. But do we see how this spits in the face of the purpose for which our country was created? Do we see how this spits in the face of the evangelistic quality of the gospel? What is good is meant to be shared, not just to be safeguarded. This freedom, this faith, is, is, is not meant to be a fortress, a stronghold, but a beacon for all people, drawing people in. You know, I may not be particularly old, but I've learned a thing or two in my uh, 32 years about how the devil likes to operate, uh, about how the devil likes to organize his battle plans. He's got a big playbook. Uh, we all know this. We've seen it. Fear, temptation, division. But there's no strategy uh, that Satan likes to employ more than isolation. He loves isolation. He loves nothing more than to lure people off on their own. He loves nothing more than to make people feel uh, as though they're not part of a community. He loves nothing more than to make people feel as if they have nothing at all to share with each other. He loves nothing more than to take away the sense of duty uh, to each other that we should all inherently feel as Americans and as Catholics. Look at our culture right now, guys. What is one of the biggest lies that you'll hear repeated over and over again. Stop pushing your ideas on others. You do your thing, I'll do mine. How dare you have the audacity to assume that you have something good to give to me? Do you think that you're better than me? Do you think that I can't handle myself by myself? What happens these days if you were to offer someone our American view of freedom? What if you dare suggest that someone might be more joyful doing the truth that they ought than the things that they want? Well, then you're a bigot, right? You're labeled a bigot. What happens if you try to share your Catholic faith with someone these days? What if you dare suggest that someone might be more joyful embracing the truth and the freedom of Jesus than the lies of our culture? Well, that's even worse. You're imposing your religion, your values, and you're an even bigger bigot. Man, what a load of garbage, right? What a load of garbage. If we're to have any future as a country, if we're to have any future as a church, we need to get over this stupid guilt trip that Satan is trying to send us on. As Catholic Americans, we have the right to do what we ought, and what we ought to do is share our freedom and our values, and the hope of our faith with others. What we ought to do is put a, a, a dagger into the heart of isolationism and rediscover the fact that we belong to each other, and that our duty is to each other. All men deserve freedom. All men deserve to know truth and to operate in truth. All men deserve uh, to know and to have hope in the fact that God loves them, God died for them, and offers them salvation. That's our strength as Catholic American men. And you know what? It's great to share American freedom, but to share our Catholicism, that hits even deeper, right? Our faith builds on our freedom. There's the freedom that comes from the right to do what we ought. There's a freedom that comes from sharing what is true and good. But there's a deeper freedom that comes from knowing he who is truth, he who is goodness itself. This is the type of freedom that saves lives. This is the type of freedom that unites men in faith and hope. This is the, the type of freedom that not only ought to be shared, but needs to be shared. We're at too precarious a place in the life of our nation and our world right now not to share this. People need to know Jesus. They need to know the truth of their worth. But how should we share this? How should we share this? If there's a certain freedom that comes in Christ's love and redemption and salvation offered to us, how can we share it with our brothers and sisters in a distinctly American way? In order to answer this question uh, this morning, I want to pose to you the examples of three holy American men. Uh, each of these three men believed in faith and freedom with all their hearts. Uh, they had an incredible desire and sense of duty to share the goodness of God with others, especially those who needed it most. 
Uh, and each of these men uh, went about the mission of sharing uh, this goodness in totally different ways. I think you'll find that these men are relatable. Why? Because they're like us. They're like us. They lived in this country. They embraced our values. They rooted for our sports teams. Uh, they listened to our music. And they shared the gospel from a place of humility. Isn't that the American way? I said this morning at, uh, at Mass, I know some of you were there, one of my favorite books of all time is Tom Brokaw's The Greatest Generation. It's just hundreds of pages of stories of men and women from World War, era, uh, World War II era America. Men and women just making humble sacrifices for the good of others, most of whom they had never even met. Lost in this reality television award show kind of culture that we live in now in 2022, is the fact that strength and heroism uh, so often originate from a place of humility. Most of us will never fill an arena while we share the gospel, right? Most of us will never gain fame and fortune by sharing Jesus with others, and that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. But I hope we can all see through the, ex the examples of these three men that we are more than capable of living out the evangelistic call of our Catholic faith and our commitment to freedom as Americans in simple yet very profound ways. I hope that we can all see through these saintly men that we're all called to sacrifice for our brothers, for the sake of our brothers. We're all called to recognize what is good and to share it. In his encyclical letter, Evangelii Gaudium, or on the joy of the gospel, Pope Francis says that the church uh, is sent by Jesus Christ as a sacrament of salvation offered by God. Through the example of these three men, I hope that we can see how God is calling each of us to be a living sacrament to others, a prophetic witness to God's goodness and God's freedom through the most common yet extraordinary of ways. I want to begin today by speaking of, about my good friend, uh, Blessed Solanus Casey, the Capuchin friar from Detroit, Michigan. Father Solanus was beatified at the Detroit Lions Ford Field in November of 2017. And to my knowledge, that's about the only major win ever to be recorded in that stadium. <laughs> over over 50,000 people, uh, including myself, my parents, and a few of my friar brothers, we gathered for this beatification mass. And it was surreal. It was surreal to see the enormous jumbotrons uh, projecting this frail, bearded friar in, in place of what would normally be, you know, quarterbacks and linesmen. Uh, the morning after the beatification mass, I attended a, a Sunday liturgy at a parish in, in Ann Arbor. And the deacon gave a, a homily, and he fought back tears as he was preaching. As he spoke about this spiritual legacy of Blessed Solanus, a man who on the previous day had been adored by thousands, most of whom had never even met him. So why did they come? Well, Father Solanus, he had a reputation as a miracle worker. Hundreds of miraculous medical cures were attributed to him uh, and his prayers during his lifetime, as well as countless uh, miraculous recoveries from addiction and financial ruin, despair, religious indifference. Simply put, if Father Solanus prayed for you, your life was going to be blessed in some distinct way. And many of the people who attended his beatification mass on that freezing cold day uh, in, in November of 2017 believed that the holy life of Father Solanus had touched their own lives in some way, maybe through the healing of a, of a parent or a grandparent, maybe just through stories of this mystical brown robe priest that had been passed down from generation to generation. And with all this talk of the miraculous, because that's what you often hear when you hear people talk about Solanus Casey, it's easy to picture him as this sort of uh, whimsical, totally unrelatable uh, figure. Uh, but nothing could be further from the truth. Barney Casey, as he was known when he was born in 1870 to uh, first-generation Irish immigrants, he was one of the most unassuming, humble figures you could ever pick to fulfill such an incredible role within the life of the church. You see, Father Solanus was almost never father at all. He failed out of one seminary uh, before another seminary allowed him to be ordained to the priesthood under one condition. He wouldn't be allowed to preach 
or to hear confessions. No preaching, no confessions. So as a priest simplex, Father Solanus was considered too simple and too lacking in theological wisdom to be able to handle many of the typical duties of the priesthood. Although he was ordained a priest, his ministry came with, uh, with special restrictions. Guys, I don't know about you all, but if I were insulted in this way, uh, I'd be out. Okay, you don't want me? Good riddance. I'll take my talents elsewhere, right? Would have been too, pride, too prideful to accept this compromised version of the priesthood. At least that's how I would have seen it. That's not at all how Father Solanus saw it, though. He was a different breed. Years of study and sacrifice, and he celebrated his first Mass with incredible gratitude for the joy uh, of the gift of the priesthood which had been conferred upon him by God's grace. Uh, throughout his ministry, he was given the most common of responsibilities, ones that today we might be expect to be offered to uh, lay volunteers, not a man who spent uh, many, many years in priestly formation. Nevertheless, Father Solanus saw no problem at all being a, a trainer of altar servers, a keeper of bees, and best of all, the guy who opened the door, the guy who opened the door to visitors at the friary. For 21 years, Solanus Casey served as the porter, or the greeter, of St. Bonaventure Friary in Detroit. Uh, his community put him there for one simple reason, to open the door for people. Uh, and open the door he did, just not in the way that they expected him to. Uh, within a short time of being placed in this role of porter, the amount of visitors at St. Bonaventure Friary began to grow exponentially. Uh, usually a porter would just simply open the door and direct the person who was visiting to the friar that they had actually come to see. Uh, but in this unusual uh, circumstance, it was the doorman. It was Father Solanus who was being sought after. It was his wisdom, his holiness, his listening ear that people desired. And so the line grew. It would stretch around the block, even in the depths of winter on the Canadian border, uh, this line stretched further and further. And Father Solanus would just go without sleep for hours and hours at a time, save for a few naps he would take under his desk uh, when the line died down. In that respect, he was a lot like George Costanza in Seinfeld. <laughs> uh, and all sorts of people would come to see Father Solanus, uh, devout Catholics, atheistic communists, uh, people struggling with health issues, uh, people who are down on their walk because of the Depression, people headed off to fight in World War II, people suffering from addiction, and he met them all. And he met them all in the exact same way, with total humility. Total humility, no judgment, no motives other than to open the door, to be the one who opened the door to Christ through holy listening. Because that's what Father Solanus did. He listened. He listened. He couldn't hear confessions. He couldn't preach grand sermons, so he listened. He heard the cry of the poor in the city, and he blessed them. He blessed them firstly with his presence and with his attentiveness. Sometimes with the suffering, there's no greater medicine than just a listening ear, right? And then he blessed them by his simple faith. Father Solanus was known to approach almost any concern from anybody with one simple piece of advice. He would say, thank God ahead of time. Thank God ahead of time for the good things he's going to do in your life. Thank God ahead of time and expect him to work. Then he would enroll the afflicted person in a prayer registry and send them on their way with a, a blessing of a relic of the true cross. Uh, it doesn't get any simpler than that. It really doesn't. Yet the miracles came and they kept coming and they keep coming even today. And 50,000 people went to go see this man beatified at Ford Field. I, I hope that you're all picking up what I'm trying to, to lay down here. And that is that the life of Father Solanus is at, at once completely extraordinary, but at the same time, totally ordinary. Totally ordinary. He was a priest and acted as a merciful father for the wayward and a steadfast shepherd for the lost, but he was just like all of us. He was just like uh, all of you here. He was limited in what he could offer others, so he figured, no problem, I'll just give them God. I'll give them God. And that's what Father Solanus did through listening and prayers. He opened the door to God. He opened the door to freedom for so many people who desperately needed to experience it. Freedom from illness, 
freedom from financial strain, freedom from mental anguish, but most importantly, Father Solanus opened the door to the freedom that comes in Christ Jesus. It's the freedom that comes when we know that we are heard and that we're loved. And Father Solanus shows us that every single one of us is capable of offering that freedom to others. We can all offer that freedom to our brothers. Every single one of us has a duty to offer that freedom to our brothers. As American Catholics, we understand that freedom is a gift to be shared and the freedom of being heard and loved by the Lord through the ears and the words of another is an invaluable gift. Uh, the next American man I want to talk about is a, is a personal favorite of mine, although I think, at least at this point, he remains relatively obscure. Uh, many of you, I know, are familiar with Father Emil uh, Capon, uh, the heroic American priest who was killed in the Korean POW camp uh, while serving as a chaplain to our soldiers uh, overseas. And while so much can be said about Father Capon, I want to use this opportunity to bring attention to a similar American hero uh, who hails from my own family's home of Staten Island, New York, uh, fitting that the forgotten borough would be the home of a forgotten saint, Father Vincent R. Capadano, chaplain to the United States Marine Corps during the Vietnam War. Father Capadano was what I think you'd call an all-American kid. He was the 10th son of Italian immigrants, an athlete, handsome, smart. His family just instilled within him a deep appreciation for hard work uh, and discipline. And unfortunately, these were characteristics that he would really have to utilize as an early age when his, his father died, when Vincent was only 10 years old. So he, uh, he went to study at, at Fordham University in the, in the Bronx, and, and he uh, went on to work after graduating as an insurance clerk for just a short time before he, he finally answered a long discerned call to the priesthood. But it wasn't just any call to the priesthood, it was a call to uh, the, the specific call to missionary life. Father Vincent uh, Capadano joined formation for the Mary Knoll Fathers, who many of you probably remember were very popular decades ago. Uh, he joined in 1949 with the expectation that he would spend his life serving people in foreign lands, bringing the gift of Jesus to people who had never met him. But the missionary life was very difficult for, for Father Capadano. Uh, he struggled to learn languages and to adapt to new cultures. And although he, he served very admirably in Taiwan and Hong Kong, his vocational discernment took a real turn, took him in a new direction in the 1960s. Uh, with United States military involvement in Vietnam uh, escalating, Father Capadano asked permission from his community if he could have his um, obedience transferred from the Marino Fathers to the military archdiocese so he could serve as a chaplain to Americans who were fighting overseas. And permission was granted. Father Vincent joined the, the Navy Chaplain Corps and he was shipped off to Vietnam to serve alongside the 7th Marines. From a certain standpoint, I guess you could say that the, the Father Vincent's time as a missionary was, was a bit of a failure. Uh, he didn't persevere uh, in the initial call that he felt from the Lord. He didn't persevere as a marrying old father. But that's certainly not my standpoint at all. Uh, this was a man who was called above all else to serve others. It just took him uh, a few more years uh, to realize what the actuality of that, of that call was. And, the, and in the war-torn jungles of Vietnam, Father Vincent did find his call. Among the men he, he served, he was known as the Grunt Padre. The Grunt Padre. He lived with the grunts. He was housed with the grunts. He did everything the grunts did. He accepted no luxury that the men he served didn't also receive. He was known to play poker with them, to have a, a beer with them, accompany them on virtually every single mission. And this sort of commitment wasn't expected at all from a, from a military chaplain. But Father Vincent made it his distinct mission to, uh, as the, in the words of, of Pope Francis today, he wanted to smell like the sheep. He wanted to smell like the sheep. He wanted nothing to separate him from them except for this uh, indelible mark of priesthood on his soul. And he never shied away from the duty befitting of that mark of priesthood. He said mass for the men. He prayed with the men. He consoled these men in their times of uh, mental anguish. 
He offered them the sacraments, many times in very hostile conditions, and he even out uh, organized outreach to the local Vietnamese villages that were affected by the fighting. Uh, as a pastor, Father Vincent didn't see himself as being above anybody. Rather, he lived out his, his call to service through this radical accompaniment. He stood in solidarity with embattled men, and he said to them, guys, we're all in this together. It's not me and you, we're in this together. I won't abandon you, God will not abandon you. And he proved the extent of this solidarity by making the ultimate sacri a sacrifice for his, for his men. He proved just how far God is willing to go for the salvation of souls by following his men to the gates of hell itself. On Labor Day of, of 1967, during what became known as Operation Swift, Father Capitano jumped into a departing helicopter at the last moment to accompany the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines into a region of very heavy fighting. Uh, after surviving a nighttime ambush, but experiencing very heavy casualties, a nearby battalion called for reinforcements, and Father Vincent Capitano found himself among those reinforcements. Uh, soon after a landing, the Marines recognized that they had been virtually surrounded and outnumbered by the People's Republic of Vietnam, five to one, five to one. The, the survivors said the gunfire was so loud, so constant, that it, it could be best described as the thundering of Niagara Falls. It was so disorienting that the guys couldn't even figure out what direction to shoot. The operation just devolved into chaos. And Father Vincent, he ran around the battlefield, just anointing men, tending to their spiritual and their physical needs. He was wounded by gunfire himself. He was shot in the hand, he was shot in the arm, but he could not be stopped from being there for his men. His last moments on earth were spent uh, shielding a wounded Marine from a nearby machine gunner. Father Vincent was shot 27 times in the back, and he died instantly. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. He received a, a bronze star, a purple heart, the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry, a naval ship, the USS Capadano, was commissioned in his honor. But there's one accolade that overshadows all of these. Today, Father Vincent R. Capadano is declared a servant of God by the church the first step on the road to becoming an officially recognized saint. Unfortunately, uh, in recent months, his cause for canonization, which was taken up primarily by the military archdiocese, but also with support from the Marian Old Fathers, uh, his cause has hit a bit of a roadblock. Uh, the powers that be in Rome have declared that with, with ongoing military actions in the world today, specifically, as we all know, in Ukraine and, and Russia, uh, raising someone from the military for veneration uh, may not be appropriate for our church at this time. Uh, the consensus among some of the men tasked with reviewing the life of Father Vincent is that he was more of a war hero uh, than a hero for Christ, and that he showed no real conversion or growth in holiness in his life. Uh, with all due respect, and this is my opinion and no one else's, so don't get me in trouble for this. Uh, that's a travesty. That's an absolute joke. Uh, I have un unkinder words to say, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Respectfully, these people obviously don't understand Americans. Father Vincent didn't view his life as an action movie, right? It was an act of duty, a duty of radical accompaniment. He believed that all men deserve freedom, uh, and not just external freedom, the type of freedom that our military men attempted to secure for the Vietnamese people, but freedom in Christ. The freedom of knowing that Christ is with you, even in the darkness, even when the bullets start to fly and death is closing in on every side. That's the freedom that Father Vincent fought for. And I don't know about you all, but this is exactly the type of guy we need to become a saint, to be recognized as a saint in our church, a good man. A good man. He was a courageous man. He was a man who acted with a sense of duty uh, to those around him, a shepherd who would follow his sheep to the end of the world, and further, a man who shows that war is about more than victory and defeat, but about the solidarity of men united in the pursuit of good. 
Uh, the, the good news, the military archdiocese led by uh, Archbishop Timothy Broglio continues to fight hard for this cause of canonization. Uh, so let us pray that God's will is, is done. The last man I want to talk about uh, today is not a priest. You will not find any church that I'm aware of uh, named for him. You probably won't even uh, hear his name mentioned by most Catholics. But that's not to say that he isn't celebrated. In fact, September 15th of every year is a day set aside to celebrate this man's life and accomplishments. Uh, his likeness is cast in bronze in many locations. His name is revered by men around the world. Uh, and even though he isn't canonized, he's still enshrined, uh, just in a slightly different Hall of Fame than the rest of the saints. I'm referring to one of the greatest baseball players of all time, Roberto Clemente. And now before you get on my case and say Roberto Clemente isn't an American, uh, I'll admit that you're somewhat right. He was born in Puerto Rico, and he associated very strongly with that native heritage throughout his life. But considering that Puerto Rico has been a U.S. territory since 1898, and the fact that Roberto Clemente lived a great deal of his life in the United States, and the fact that he served in the U.S. military in the Marine Corps Reserves, and the fact that there's nothing more American, let's be honest, nothing more American than being a champion of America's pastime, I feel that he deserves to be recognized among Catholic American men. I hope that none of you disagree with that. I love hearing about Roberto Clemente uh, because although he had 3,000 career hits, 240 home runs, a career batting average of 317, and I assume he made a good bit of money piling up those stats, he still strikes me as this incredibly relatable Catholic man. This was a guy who humbly gave thanks for these incredible blessings that, that he had received in life, and he felt an obligation to share all the good that he had received with others. He placed his Catholic faith as just the highest priority in his life, and he allowed it to inform his every action. Uh, Roberto, he grew up as an unusually pious boy. That's what people said about him just simple things. He'd ask for his parents' blessing every time he left the house. He went to go and serve at funerals for people that he didn't even know. And that set him apart from an early age. But it wasn't until his time living in Pittsburgh, playing for the Pirates, that Roberto Clemente's faith really began to blossom. He became very close friends with a local priest named Father Alvin Gutierrez, who was also from Puerto Rico. And uh, he, Father Alvin became a mentor to Roberto. We'll never know. The, the intellectual nature of Roberto Clemente's Catholic faith. He obviously leaves no behind. Uh, he doesn't leave behind any profound writings or sermons or uh, treatises or anything like that. Uh, but as Jesus says in Matthew 7, 16, you will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. And the fruit of Roberto Clemente's faith was action. During his time as a player in the United States, uh, Roberto Clemente became known not only for his tremendous skill as a ball player, but his incredible charity. His incredible charity. He was even known to give in very generous handouts to panhandlers, which was much to the dismay of his teammates. He also began free baseball camps for uh, the youth, uh, underprivileged youth in the area and in, in Puerto Rico. And he spent virtually every offseason involved completely, totally immersed in any sort of charitable effort he could think of. Uh, to this day, many of you are probably aware, Major League Baseball gives out a yearly Roberto Clemente Award for the player who most exemplifies selflessness and charity and community involvement. And this is a fitting honor for a man who once remarked that there's nothing wrong with our homes, our country, that a little more care, a little more concern, a little more love won't cure. Although Roberto Clemente was often the subject of racism, you know, playing as a non-white player during the segregation era, he never let it plant any seeds of bitterness in his heart. Uh, rather, he just saw his, his ability to play baseball as a gift from God, and he wanted to use that platform to do good and to really just transcend athletics altogether. Just a few months after recording his 3,000th hit, and I'm sure many of you remember this uh, personally, just, just right after that 3,000th hit, Roberto Clemente became very much involved in a humanitarian effort following a, a really devastating earthquake in Nicaragua. 
wasn't uncommon for him to spend those, the off seasons helping the poor, but this situation was, was specifically dire. It just left thousands displaced without food or water or shelter. And the first three shipments that Roberto sent via plane to Nicaragua were intercepted uh, by the corrupt government and kind of just hoarded by the government officials. So Roberto decided that he would personally get on the plane and go with the fourth shipment, hoping that his presence, his personal presence and his influence in that part of the world would, would assure that the provisions would uh, be received by the needy. But the plane was filled beyond capacity, far beyond capacity, and just moments after takeoff from Puerto Rico, it crashed into the Atlantic Ocean just off the coast, and Roberto Clemente and four others were killed. Uh, over the years, there have been kind of rumblings of a cause of canonization for Roberto Clemente being taken up. And as much as I would love to see that, uh, I would love to see a Hall of Famer being elevated to the halls of heaven. And I think it would be such an awesome example for any kid who ever picked up a baseball glove and wanted to learn the game. I can't help but think that Roberto Clemente would have laughed at that idea. He saw nothing special about the way that he lived. As Father Gutierrez said during his funeral mass, where there was need, there was Roberto Clemente. He was a man of action. He was a man who understood that the many blessings that God uh, bestowed upon him in this life warranted a degree of duty. That which is good ought to be given to others. And what Roberto gave was humble provision, a reminder to others that in their time of need, they would never be left alone. He gave them the interior freedom of knowing that God from his abundance provides for his children. And this freedom saved lives, both physically and spiritually. And that's where I want to end today. Could I have spoken about other Catholic, inspirational, Catholic American men? Absolutely. The list, uh, thankfully, goes on and on. Father Emil uh, Capon, Stanley Rother, Aloysius Schwartz, Michael McGivney, Fulton Sheen. I hope that all of you in your own lives can identify fellow brothers in Christ who exhibit the qualities of any one of these men or of a blessed Solanus Casey or a servant of God Vincent Cappadano or a Hall of Famer Roberto Clemente. I'm sure that you can, I hope you can. And it's important that we do. We're at such a pivotal moment right now in, in the life of our great nation and in the life of our, our, of our church. We're losing sight of what freedom is. And it's happening quickly. Uh, we're losing sight of why it should be loved why it should be shared by all men. We're losing sight of, of, our, of our duty as Catholics to evangelize. We're losing sight of the fact that Jesus became incarnate to break the chains of captives and to offer spiritual freedom beyond all telling. The freedom of knowing that we're heard. The freedom of knowing that God is with us. The freedom of knowing that God provides for us. As American men, it's our duty to remind this nation of what it's forgotten. What Pope St. John Paul II tried to tell us not that many years ago, that freedom is the right to do what we ought. And what we ought to do is share what is good and what is true with others. And from a distinctly Catholic American perspective, this means that we should desire to know personally he who is truth and he who is goodness itself so we can share him with others. So we can share Jesus with others because he is truth and he is goodness. The most noble thing an American can do is to defend and promote the freedom that we find in Christ. My prayer for all of us is that we spend our lives honoring that duty. Thank you. That was very inspiring. We have a little gift for you that I think that you'll really appreciate. So, especially with your talking about baseball. Well, let me just tell you that Father Zach is a New York Yankee fan. And you know that the Yankees lost, they got swept by the Astros. Pretty good. It's better not be an Astro. So, 
No, we, so we did, we, we thought about getting him a Yankee hat or a Yankee shirt or something like that, but we said, no, let's just get him Yankee socks so he can hide them under his robe. And, uh, <laughs> Appreciate you, and, and I hope I hope everyone was inspired by him through through our through just our simple living and being who we are. We can make a difference.